Amen. How many know friends are cheap in the world today, right? You go on Facebook, how many friends you got? I'm glad they don't show up at my house all at once. Unless they brought cleaning buckets and whatever, food. But um, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord's uh, attention to this word. Lord, we ask that you watch our hearts and watch our ears, that we would be listening with faith, that we would uh, hear your heart through my heart to our hearts. Lord, that this word would have its own life independent of us, that it would be a seed that, that is planted and brings miracle grow in our hearts. And we bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I'd like to, um, last time I was here, the only time I was here, I talked about becoming like Christ, that this is, this is the main agenda. You know, I mean, some of us, we have this feeling that the main agenda is some unique individual destiny that is separate from becoming like Christ. But becoming like Christ is the thing. Whatever we're doing subordinate to that happens to just be a, a way of expressing becoming like Christ. Jesus said if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light with no dark part. The only way we can get full of light, full of the radiance of the Lord as if we're focused on that, we're focused on becoming like Jesus. We've made up our mind that we're not turning to the left or to the right. If somebody strikes us, somebody we turn the other cheek. We're we're using absolutely everything about life that we experience. We're using that. God is using that to create in in our hearts a functional manifestation of the character and the life and spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and somewhere along the line, we, you know, we kind of go to church, we kind of sleepwalk, not in church, but I mean, in, in fact, if the Lord gives you a dream during my message, I don't want to hear that, all right? <laughs> but, but we go through life, and, we, and it's kind of like, okay, I'm saved, okay, I'm forgiven, and we just, we're Christians, and now I was a rat before, and now I got to try and look like I'm a nice person. But we don't deal with the heart issue, and we don't, and we start learning simply how to have church. And, and I want to say that, uh, that there's so much more for us, amen? He gave ministries, uh, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. The building up. Everybody say building up. Building up. All right? Until we all attain the unity of the faith to the measure of the stature, listen to this, that belongs to the fullness of Christ. The, everybody say fullness. This is God's heart. It's not just that we honor what God has done. We do that. But we also recognize what God is doing. And what he's doing is he seeks to transform our hearts. He seeks to make a dwelling place in us for his son. As in heaven, so also on earth. As he is, so also are we in this world. As he is. This is the whole thing. He who says he abides in him, he ought to walk even as Jesus did walk. Amen? Amen? All right, this is just the introduction, so I don't want you to get too excited, but, uh, but get as excited as you want. If you have excitement, go ahead and use it. But So now I want to I wanna narrow our focus down to one dimension, but it's a massive, major aspect of the Lord's heart. When we talk about becoming like Christ, and we talk about gathering even our offensive and offenses and things that have hurt us, and we use that to, to manifest the forgiveness of the Lord. We use that to, to release people. We learn how to love. We learn how to take faith. And one thing that I want us to, to learn, if you would, is how to stand in the gap. Now, the Bible talks about the gap. It talks about, in uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, both it mentions Isaiah, it talks about, I look for a man or person to stand in the gap. To stand in the gap. The gap is the distance between the way things are and the way things could be if God moved, okay? The gap is the distance between no prayer 
and prayer. The gap is the possibility realm. It's a realm that's often inhabited by demons of discouragement and demons of fear and spirits of hate and bitterness and regret. These things want to get in there and they want to buffet us and hold us back and keep us from praying and keep us in a position of seeking revenge. And yet if we will stand in the gap, The Lord said, I look for a person to stand in the gap. If you look at that whole context, it's phenomenal. When the Lord is talking about what was going on in Israel at that time, it was 10 times worse than our world is today. It was in the temple of God there were prostitutes. I mean, it was just, there was such hypocrisy, such sin, such horrible abominations. And yet the Lord says, I looked for a person. I looked for one man to stand in the gap. One person that I would not smite the land with a curse, that I would not destroy this culture. He said, if I could find one person that has my heart for mercy, that has my heart for righteousness, and instead of just judging, and instead of just getting frustrated, and instead of just getting angry, this individual would plant themselves before my throne of grace and cry to me and cry to me vicariously, repenting for the sin of their culture. If I could find one person, I would delay my wrath. I would forgive that sin and take a mercy route to the future. Somebody ought to shout here because this is... This is amazing what our God will do. Because I look at the world. I look at the world. And I see the world becoming increasingly chaotic. Increasingly uh, the daughter of Sodom and Gomorrah. I see it buying in to things that God destroyed the world for. God destroyed the world for the violence that was in the world during Noah's time. Okay, he destroyed the world because of violence. But we sit down with our remotes and we're entertained by violence. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I mean, we think the big deal is the immorality that was in and the perversion that was in Sodom. But it was, it was the violence of the ancient world. And, and so I'm saying, Jesus said to Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin, he says, look. He said, if the miracles were done in you, were done in Sodom, Sodom would have remained until this day. In other words, if Christ would, would have been manifest in Sodom's time, right? What would have, there would have been such an influence that they would have turned. But it was the apathy and the unbelief of those local cities that he was judging. And we are called not to be apathetic, not to just say, oh, Lord, I can't wait till you come. But we're going to live right here. <laughs> you know, come on. I hear, I hear some guys, friends of mine, some of them, you know, God's going to destroy this, God's going to destroy that. They have like the Samson mentality, you know. I, I try and tell them, listen, yeah, God could destroy sin in all sorts of ways, but he doesn't have to destroy us with it, which is what happened with Samson. I don't want to die, you know, under the rubble of judgment. I want to be on the other side of that, praying for mercy, believing God. Come on, you guys, you hear what I'm saying? And so he says, my house. My house will be called a house of prayer for, everybody say for, For. all right, prayer for all nations. My house will be called, people are going to look and say, this must be the house of the Lord. How do you know? They're praying for their country. They're praying for their city. They're crying out because they know mercy triumphs over judgment. They know that the mercy that God has shown them. I know that the mercy that God has shown me, I know that's what God wants me to show to the world. And I'm not saying that we compromise or that we stand back and we just ignore the things. I'm saying we stand right in the gap and we begin to cry to God. And we say, Lord, you are so righteous and your judgments and your justice is everlasting. And we don't want that to be in any way compromised, Lord, but we also know that you are slow to anger and you are abundant in loving kindness. And that, uh, you understand what I'm saying? And so this, you don't need a, a doctorate in theology to do what I'm talking about. You just need a heart that doesn't harden when you see things that are wrong. We just need hearts that can possess the the mind of Christ, which is to see the need and not just criticize, not just destroy the world, but see the need and then die for it so that mercy would spread, so that God's heart would be satisfied in sending his son to die for the sin of the world. 
So this is introduction part two. <laughs> All right, turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. And I, I love the scriptures. So the big enemy in this, where we're going to go this morning, the big enemy that holds back what we could be doing, what we, how we could be serving the Lord. The big enemy, the Bible refers to this enemy as the accuser of the brethren. It's this fault-finding spirit. It's this, it's this demon. It's, the, it's a name for Satan himself. Is that he, he is the accuser. He's the critic of all things that are good and holy and righteous. And in this chapter, it talks about John has this vision, and I'm going to make an application. I'm not going to make an interpretation as much as an application, because this is a book of revelations, right? Okay, it's not a book of speculations, but revelation. But you can make application. You all with me on that? Okay. So we're going to make an application. So here's this woman. John has a vision. She's clothed the sun. The crown of 12 stars is on her head. The moon is under her feet. Some Bible commentators will put Israel over the top. Some will put the church over the top. Uh, you know, kind of to introduce that chapter. And um, it's hard to, to see that this would be either the church or Israel in the sense of a woman clothed with the sun. That this typically has not been the stature of the church and it's not been the stature of Israel. But to me, it is a symbol. It's a prophetic picture of people of prayer. Okay, and the reason why I say that is because this woman who has in her inside is she's pregnant. She's pregnant and she's in labor to give birth. The next verse reads, okay, so John's, so I, here's what I'm saying that this represents. For, just for a moment, just let's not discuss the genetics, the DNA, the you know, the, the history, cultural history of this. But let's say that from every nation, whatever it is, there are people who are pregnant with a promise from God. There are people that know that there's more. There are people that know what we could have. They feel it in their inside. It kicks them in the night and wakes them up. They are pregnant with a prom. Prayer is pregnancy with the promise of God. Okay, that's what prayer is. I had a terrifying experience of being there to deliver <clears throat> my, our five children. I say, I, I was terrified. I was so upset. My wife would say, <clears throat> come here, just let me just have this baby and I'll make you some tea. <laughs> But I was so stressed out because your man can't do anything, you know, except try not to faint. And, and she said, well, come here, let me rub your shoulders till we get done. I said, oh, I need this. It was terrible. I'm serious. We had our kids at home. And, and I was supposed to catch them. <clears throat> and, uh, but they're so slippery, you know. <laughs> They come out like grease lightning. <laughs> but fortunately, you know, God put that rope on them so they don't go too far. <laughs> so anyway, did I say that out loud? Because I wasn't planning on it. Oh, God. Anyhow, but to watch her, you know, to watch her, my wife, to be in the, the throes of delivering a child. She, you know, there were times with the first one, there were times she would... Like in between contractions, she would she would say, "I'm not going to do this no more. I'm going. <laughs> I'll be back later. You know, maybe tomorrow. You know, or something. I'm going to go shopping." And then all of a sudden, the contraction comes, and you just cannot do something else. Right, right. You know what I mean? This is the task at hand, and I think that there's an application because the woman here is pregnant, and she's clothed with the sun, and she's got the moon under her feet. In other words, she's walking on the powers of darkness. She's got something of the holiness of God. And every, every generation, every move of God that ever occurred, it, it came through a people like this that were pregnant with the promise of God. 
And they could no sooner stop praying and stop crying and stop believing, whether it was for their children or for their neighborhood or for their church, but they were pregnant with something that they had to stand before the throne of God's grace and they had to pray about until that thing was born. Are you with me all here, friends? And so she gives birth to a child, a male child, who is caught up to God and to his throne. But in this picture, there is a dragon. And, and if you want to read it, the dragon is right there. And she was with child, verse 2, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. And then another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And, and on his heads were seven diadems, and his tail swept away a third of the stars. And a dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Now, let me just, again, make an application. If you're really pregnant with something from God, when you give birth to that thing, when you hit, there's a certain critical mass, there's a certain point where that thing that you were pregnant with, that you prayed for, begins to manifest. It comes out. It has its own life. It begins to emerge in the world. But it's a baby. Whatever you pray into being, anything you pray from a word from God that you're releasing and you're praying and releasing and you're trusting God and you're crying out to God and you're labor to give birth, whatever you give birth to will emerge in the world like a baby. It'll be vulnerable. It won't know everything. It'll get up to walk and fall. It'll slobber over itself. It'll need its diaper changed. I'm not making sense. You understand? And that's when the dragon wants to devour. Okay? The dragon wants... See, that thing that is emerging through our prayer, that thing that is emerging in the earth, that, that church that you're praying for, that child that you're crying out, the smallest of things is what the answer to prayer becomes. You understand what I mean? I was raised in northern New Jersey, okay? It was all city after city after city after city. I know it was horrible. <laughs> it's when I used to be Italian. And, um, but I'm born again. Amen. But I do backslide once in a while, and you want to watch out. I was not a farmer's son, all right? I didn't know gardening or anything like that. I just simply had... A desire. My wife and I got married. We were living in Hawaii, and you throw a pack of seeds out, almost anything will grow. So I decided I would have a garden. How hard could that be? You know, what's wrong with? So I went over. I cleared with a hoe. I mean, it was like I was like so primitive. And but I did buy a pack of seeds. I cleared this spot of ground and I made little mounds and I put my little seeds in there and little corn seeds and little lettuce and celery and all these little seeds and I put them in there and watered them faithfully I even went to right next to the property was a horse field uh I mean a pasture what would they call it pasture <laughs> horse field where did that come I meant to say force field there you go <laughs> no there was there were horses behind this fence and and I would go in and I would pick up with my hands the manure and I would work it into the ground and uh, everybody thought I was crazy or starving I don't know but <laughs> and pretty soon green would sprout up you know and not knowing that the beginning looks nothing like the end I weeded all those baby turnips I weeded them right out of the garden because the little thing did not look like it showed on the package. You have to recognize the answer to your prayer when it doesn't look like it. You understand what I'm saying? You can't say, how come you're not a head of lettuce yet? You have to say, now you're just a leaf of lettuce. And let it grow, you know, let some things grow. And I'm saying this because I'm talking about being pregnant with a prayer and a vision from God. See, knowing the church ought to be more. Knowing that your family ought to have 
uh, your kids ought to be walking with God better, knowing that you should be walking, knowing your husband should be walking, knowing your pastor should be walking, knowing that things could be better, but instead of just criticizing and finding fault and accusing, we stand in the gap and we pray for mercy and we pray for grace and we pray for help and we pray for breakthroughs and we stand there and we cry out to God and we bind that discouraging voice of the enemy and we stand in the gap and we pray and we pray and we believe God. And we're, but when that thing comes, it's not going to look necessarily like the one who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron, which this woman gives birth to. It's going to look like a baby. That answer to prayer. See, Satan wants to take away your hope. He wants to take away that promise. You hear what I'm saying? He wants to take it away because that hope, that dream that he wants to steal is the future you. It's the future that will be there if we give birth and then nurture what we give birth to. And I hope I'm making sense to you, right? That there's something there that we can release and then pray and see it protected. It's like when I was, uh, I was in this particular church out in California back when I was a, a new Christian, and I had three other guys and I were going to a Bible college. It wasn't a Bible college we attended. It was one that had invited us to speak, have a Bible study there. And these guys would come, and they were very educated, and I was not educated, and I would go, I was going thinking that I was going to support these other guys in the car. But about halfway there, one of them said, you realize you're the one, me, you, Francis, you're the one that's going to be speaking to this group. And now this group, they didn't ever care what we had to say. They only hosted this to make fun of charismatic Christians. And I just found that out after I was in the car and after I was told that I was supposed to share, you know. Help me, Holy Ghost. And, uh, and so I got nervous. I was scared. I was like, oh, God, what, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to do? Lord, show me I can do this. God, give me a sign. Give me a sign that I can do this. Lord, help me. I need a sign. I know it's evil to seek after a sign. I repent of my evil, but please give me the sign anyway. And so... As I'm praying, we got about one exit away from where we were going to turn off. And the guy that was driving, he said, um, he said something that triggered him. I, he said, we're getting ready to turn off and we're going to be at the Bible study in about five minutes. And I said, God, you've got to give me a sign. I just blurted this out, you know. And as I'm praying, as I asked for a sign, I happened to look out across the highway. And there was a big hotel And the name of the hotel was the Franciscan Hotel. And there, between the S and C in the word Franciscan, the builders had put too big of a space. So when I said, Lord, give me a sign, I looked over and it said, Francis can. Which is what Franciscan actually spells. I mean, I asked God for a sign. He gave me a real sign. All right. Are like red, glowing, flashing. Over here, Francis. But see, I mean, God and me can do anything. You know, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so, and I'm saying that because fear and discouragement are weapons of the enemy. You know, that same church I had this, uh, <clears throat> this church that I went to had like about 800 people. 400 were prophets and 400 judged the prophets. And, uh, and you couldn't just kind of like in a small home groupy thing, you know, just politely throw your voice so it sounded like brother so-and-so talking instead of you. They had three pulpits in the front, one on one side, one on the other, and then a big pulpit in the middle. And they had on the side of church where I always sat, <clears throat> people would line up on either side and they would prophesy. The people on this side would prophesy, and the people on that side would prophesy, and there'd be a line of people to prophesy every Sunday morning. And I would get in that line, because I came from a church in Hawaii, is where, where my wife and I were, and I would get in that line, all right, because we had prophecies. We would prophesy, us young Christians, in, when we were in Maui, this little church that we were part of there, 
And I could prophesy, but I usually prophesied things that were really simple, like the sun is going to rise, thus saith the Lord, because I didn't want to be a false prophet. So I would try and do geological things that were probably going to happen anyway, you know. But I, I anticipated what was going to happen anyway, and I spoke it prophetically. So I knew I had that gift. And um, <laughs> so I got... Um, so I got, I got in the line, and, and the people on that side were prophesying, and people on this side were prophesying, and the next time that one, and this one, and that one. And it was, it was crazy. It was very militant. They would, guys that I knew, you know, would, um, and they would, all of a sudden, they were normal guys, and then, and then they stand up there, and they were, suddenly, they were speaking King James English and spitting three rows into the congregation, and I knew it had to be God. What else, what else would cause that? And, uh, but see, I was reading the Amplified Bible, and I couldn't get all my brackets and dashes <laughs> together. So I would get in the line. I'd get in the line, and I'd be trying to put all the... How many of you know about the Amplified Bible? Okay, I love that. It's my favorite, almost. But it, uh, by the time I got all my thoughts, I just could get this close, and then I would turn around, and I would walk back to my chair. And I just was so overwhelmed, like, what do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are? That, how many of you know that accusing voice? Okay. You're going to do something special for the Lord or special that you feel God has put in your heart. You are going to have a conversation with the devil, probably. And every reason why you should not, could not, ought not to be involved in whatever that thing is, the devil's going to bring it up. You remember when you failed the last time? how embarrassed you were. And so anyway, so I got into this church and I began to, I, for three weeks in a row, I would get this far and then be overwhelmed with, and then when I would turn around and I'd go down and sit down in, in my chair, then that spirit would say, why didn't you do it? You should have done it. You're going to burn in hell forever. That was the unpardonable <laughs> sin. You should have done that. How many of you know that's that boy, right? You know, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. That means Satan doesn't care what you do. You're wrong. So finally, after three weeks, w- repeating this adventure in, in uh, failure, I got on the line, and two guys, they were like born-again bouncers. They picked me up by my elbows <laughs> and carried me to the front of the line and plopped me down, and they said, now do it say it. And I was so scared and so nervous and so tongue-tied, I, I said everything wrong. I said, the devil's going to win. <laughs> oh, I mean, I mean, I was so embarrassed. It was horrible. It actually came to pass in that church a few years later. <laughs> but, but, but really, uh, they, you know what those people did? They stood and they applauded. They had been watching this struggle, this battle going on in my mind. And they stood and they applauded. And I said, okay, you know, yeah, you spoke. Good for you. Good job. Good job. Now let's try and do something Christian with it, you know. But we need people, even when we blow it, that can help us up, all right? That can pat us on the back, that don't pluck out the seed of what God has been birthing in us. We need people to pray the thing and water it in prayer and fertilize it in correction and, and, and bless it with uh, faith, you know, because imagine if Christians, I mean, God is our father. Christians ought to be in charge of the world. We ought to, we ought to be able to see in a painting that somebody does for the Lord that, it's, that it becomes something that is world-renowned. I mean, I mean, you understand what I'm saying? Beethoven was a Christian. You look at the, you know, the amazing people of of years ago, of centuries ago, the, how they changed. Newton was a Christian. I mean, how they impacted the world for God, you know, because they had God in. They didn't stop somewhere at the voice of criticism. They kept on going, you know. But see, when we fail or when, when the enemy attacks us, we, we shrink. We shrink back. We shrink and, and we, we stop. We surrender our dream. We surrender our hope. We surrender that thing that we wanted to, we thought we were called to do because we hit that wall, that discouragement, that failure. 
And, you know, you're, you're at work and you're, you want to talk to somebody about the Lord, but you're nervous. How many of you get nervous? You're gonna, so during the break time, you're going to talk to them about Jesus. And you've been thinking about it for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, and now, finally, you're going to overcome your fear. And you, and you, you, you say, hey, uh, Charlie, uh, I'd like to, um, you, you know, <clears throat> I, I, can I, I would, I've, I've had a... Um, uh, let me try to decide. <clears throat> Charlie, um, did, you, did you ever see here's the people, here's the steeple? Uh, I, well, what I'm trying to say is, is that if, if, you, um, if, you, if you give your life to, to the Lord, he'll make you just like me. <laughs> and he goes, I'm already better than you. <laughs> so, so you stop talking about the Lord. You stop sharing the Lord. I mean, you still write things on the men's room walls. But, you know, you're, you're, you're so anonymous. You so don't want to be identified as whatever so that dream gets plucked out, and there are countless numbers of Christians whose dreams have been stolen, whose dreams have been stolen by the thief who came to steal and then to kill and then to destroy. And God wants to give us our dream back. Yes. Amen? He wants to give us that hope back of doing something, of being something, of, you know, the track to that is becoming Christ-like treasures of wisdom and knowledge all the gifts are in that track of becoming like jesus i had so many opportunities to fail to blow it to say god what am i thinking that i could do this you know and if i would have stopped at the voice of i tell you the accuser almost sounds like the voice of reason you look at all the people that god used some were at some point they had to overcome the voice of reason <laughs> you know what i'm saying why do you think you can do if i had stopped back then today by the mercy of god by the grace of god by the fact that i didn't stop you know i've got millions of books that the lord uh, people have got without me advertising them you know I've, i speak to leaders in the world i'm not saying i'm anything i'm saying I, i'm as average as they get but I just didn't stop believing that God can do great things with average people. Amen. Amen. You, you see what I'm trying to say here? We have this online school. It's in 115 nations. If I would have stopped back when I deserved to stop, when I should have stopped, when it was reasonable and logical, Francis, this is definitely not your calling. I remember one time I, was, I decided to have a radio ministry. How hard could that be? It was five minutes in the morning at 6.30 in the morning. Great time for a radio, short. And, uh, and I thought, how hard could this be? I mean, what could go wrong? <laughs> and so I, I did my first week, got a tape, and I put the messages on the tape. And between Monday and Tuesday, you know, you, so you wait, five, four, three, two, one, and you say Tuesday. And you do that so the announcer can cue it up right so i'm you know i do this <clears throat> and i'm going to listen now now it's monday morning <clears throat> and i'm going to go listen to it i do the messages i do all five messages and i send them in and so the monday morning and the guy is so i'm listening now to my big break this is not a little radio station it covers three states i'm listening to my big break this is it. This is now I'm going from obscurity to public arena. All right. So you want it. This is your first impression. You never can make another first impression. All right. And they're the lastest. They're the most indelible. The guy's playing. I, I listened to Mondays ago. Oh, that wasn't that good. I need to, I need to do something. Because it is weird. You know, you're sitting by yourself and you're looking at a microphone and then and you have to act like you have a relationship with this microphone. <laughs> so it's a little weird doing that. And so I, so the guy plays Monday, and I thought, hmm, well, yeah, I hope it gets better. I'll, I'll have to listen tomorrow to see how it goes. <laughs> I didn't have to wait till tomorrow. All of a sudden, I hear my voice going, five, four, three, two, one. Greetings, this is Pastor Francis welcoming you this Tuesday. The guy played the whole week. 
with, you could hear between Wednesday and Thursday, you hear my chair squeak, squeaking. <laughs> between Thursday and Friday, I'm drinking water. <laughs> I mean, it's like, oh my God. He, he played the whole week. He couldn't tell. He couldn't tell. What is this, the Antichrist radio station? You can't tell that Monday through. I was so upset. I said, if I want to get embarrassed and humiliated, I just have to go to church. I don't have to do it publicly and pay you. So they swore. They said, no, we're never happen again. We will never do this again. We, it's our fault. You know, we'll give you a free month. You know, oh, yeah, all right. So about a month or two later, I'm getting ready to do the, the message. It's Sunday night. I'm getting ready to do the messages, you know, the five messages. It's, I go to get a tape. I go to get a new tape. And then I thought, I'm only going to use this once for these five things. What could go wrong? I'll just get a used tape. So I take this used tape out of a box. I don't look at it. And then I do our five days. And I bring it in Sunday night, and they get ready to play Mondays. And then Monday's okay. Tuesday's fine. Wednesday and Thursday are okay. Friday, the, right toward the end of the message, the tape got stuck in the spool. All right, and the announcer, whose job must have been threatened, <laughs> hits the stop eject. He whips it out. He spools it down. He thrusts it back in, all in about three seconds. He, amazing how fast. And he hits play. And you never would know that he did this unless you actually were listening. Because now what he did was he spooled it past what I had to say on the messages and what was playing is what was on the tape before. Now this tape was a tape of a board meeting I was having with my elders. And they were talking about raising my salary from $40 to $60 a week. Help me, Holy Ghost. I mean, I'm serious. I said, Lord, why did these things happen to me? And I figured it out that, you know how, like, in heaven, everything is perfect? Well, God is bored. So he says to the angels, where's Francis? We could, well, let's get a little something going on in here. <clears throat> All I'm saying is, is that part of moving on when you blow it or make a mistake or it doesn't come up to is being able to laugh at it and move on. You hear what I'm saying? Not to take yourself so seriously. Take God totally seriously, but don't. Of course, we're going to blow it. Of course, we're going to make mistakes. But of course, God is faithful. His mercies are new every morning. We can get back up. We can move on. We can put our hand in the hand of the Lord. And he can teach us what we don't know. He can show us how to do it better. Well, I'm, I'm older now. I'm, I'm too old to, to be used by the Lord. I'm no, that's not true. When the Holy Spirit is being poured out in Acts chapter 2, he says, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So if you're older, and as long as you're not dreaming during my sermon, it's good. A dream is the future you. Do you understand? God didn't even fulfill his promise to Abraham till he was almost 100. You know, till he was almost 100, till he was 99 years old. And so I'm just saying, with God, all things are possible. And you say, well, what if I believed God? What if I believed God and nothing happened? Well, then you join the people in uh, Hebrews 11. It says, all these died in the faith without receiving the promise. I'd rather die in faith than live in doubt. Rather die in faith and still believe that maybe my ancestors <clears throat> or my children or my, my church or somebody's going to hear it, my prodigy in the spirit. That, that somebody's going to get it. I'm, I may be the pioneer, and they may be the settler, you know. And uh, so you understand what I'm saying? We just don't have to quit. We just don't have to give up. Because in that process, we're becoming more and more like Jesus. And we're learning to stand in the gap for others who are becoming more and more like Jesus. It says here that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their own lives even unto death. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the word of our testimony, or reverse it, by the testimony of the word. We need to know the word, amen? 
we need to not just read our Bibles five minutes in the morning or at the stoplight, you know what I'm saying? We whip out our U, U vision, is that what it's called? U version. What's it called? U version. Okay, I got my word for today, you know, kind of like pop my vitamin, vitamin C. And, um, you know, see what I'm saying? I mean, that we actually have a relationship with the word so that uh, uh, we're carrying the substance of God. We need to have our time with the Lord. We need to allow the Lord to renew us and carry us. And so, so I'm talking about overcoming. Now, what happens, listen to this, what happens, friends, if, if we actually do this? What happens if a church, even a small church, what happens if a church gets a hold of casting down the accuser of the brethren, discerning that spirit? What happens when just two or three agree that they're not going to have the accuser of the brethren in their midst? Jesus said, if two or three agree as to touching anything, it will be done for them. This accusing spirit, what was prophesied this morning about the divisions in the body, it's the accuser in most cases, not all cases. I mean, there are some churches that ought to be by themselves because they're, they're not even churches. They're just Satan disguising himself as an angel of light. So they're, they're not even, but even there, I pray for revival to come for those churches. I pray for something to awaken in God. I don't despise the day of small beginnings because I'm an intercessor and I want the mind of Christ and I want the motive of God. Some of you may not agree with this, and that's fine. You can still go to heaven. But <laughs> like I'm in charge of who goes. I'm praying for the Catholic Church. I, I, first of all, I forgave the Pope for taking my name, all right? <laughs> I just want to give him a little slack there. But, um, but I like this guy. And you say, well, he prays to Mary. Oh, so what? He also prays to Jesus. Yeah. You know, there's all sorts of things that we can do wrong. Let's, let's see what we can pray that he can do right. What would be better to see all the criticism and all the walls and all the barriers and all the fears and all the false traditions and all the things that have been characterized by the Catholic Church and, and magnified by the, against the Catholic Church by the Protestant Church? What if the Protestant Church genuinely became a people who prayed for the Catholic Church? You understand what I'm saying? What if we stood in the gap for the Catholic Church? Amen. Right? What's better for the Catholic Church to be slapped? Or is it better for, the, for God to fall? Imagine if God, the Spirit of God, fell in the Vatican. What, I mean, I'll tell you what. In Africa, the Catholic Church is aggressively tongue-speaking Holy Ghost filled, I mean, chasing after demons in, in Kenya and in uh, Nairobi and in uh, Nigeria. I mean, they're going after God. You say, well, I don't know if I can fellowship. Well, just pray. You don't have to become Catholic to pray for Catholics. Amen? Am I making sense? You say what I'm saying? What would Jesus like? You know, what would he like? I think he'd like to see a breakthrough. And I think... That potential is there. So all I'm saying is, but reduce it down to where we are, to the size of our world and our involvement in that world. And imagine if we pray. He says, when we cast down that spirit of the accuser, he says, now, everybody say now. Now, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren has been cast out. We get rid of the accuser of the brethren in our conversation, in our attitudes toward one another, in our faith toward the church down the block. If we get uprooted out of our thought life, the fault-finding mentality, if we break our bonds with the legacy of protesting what's wrong, which is we're Protestant, Protestants, that's part of that genealogy of, of the past. If we could, and, and lots of times they had things to protest. I'm not trying to, you know, gloss over the things that were wrong. I'm just saying that we can't approach everything through the veil of it's wrong, so I protest. And I tell you everything that I see wrong. 
I'm just saying that if we will, among ourselves, in the size of a church this size or a size that's, you know, even smaller, if we will stand in the gap and cast down the accuser in our midst, we will taste. And I'm making the application. However, this is fulfilled in the future, it'll be grand. But right now, we can have a time when we cast down the accuser, where we determine if we see his brother caught in a sin, we shall ask of God, and God will give grace. God will give mercy to him. We can come to that place where our hearts are accountable to one another in love, but we are not dealing with the accuser getting in between and sowing little thoughts of anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. We're praying the hell out of one another (laughs) in a biblical way, all right? (laughs) We could have... We could have in our midst, in between us, in our relationship, now the salvation, now the power, now the authority of Christ, now the kingdom of our God has come. And if we want the kingdom, we have to reject the accuser. If we want the authority that moves forth, that advances forth, then we have to disavow the legacy of the accuser of the brethren. We overcome by the blood. That means we forgive those that have sinned against us. We forgive ourselves. We cover our hearts with the blood of Jesus. But that blood is not just for me, not just for you. It says in Isaiah 52 that he will sprinkle many nations. That blood is good enough for sprinkling the nations. I stand every night, my wife and I, we stand and we pray. Well, sometimes we sit and pray, but anyway. But we pray. We pray for our country. Lord, you said you would sprinkle many nations. And that had not been told to kings, they will know by revelation. Kings, God will speak to kings because of the blood of Jesus. And so we pray for America. We ask God to forgive our nation. We pray for for Israel. We pray for uh, the Muslim world. We ask God to forgive the terrorists. Lord, we pray warfare prayers against the spirit of terrorism, but we're, we're praying for people, praying for the Syrians. I mean, 120,000 people have been killed. How many more maimed and injured? God is shaking the Muslim world right now. Syria, Egypt, many of the countries in the Muslim world are being shaken. It's our duty to pray for these people. And the Lord says to beseech the Lord of the harvest, to send forth laborers into the harvest. We pray for Africa, Haiti, that the Koreas will be reconciled. We pray for an outpouring of the Spirit in the Philippines because the Philippines are a Christian nation surrounded by the Muslim world, and they're in all the Muslim homes. So we pray for them. We pray for Ukraine. What I'm, what I'm saying is that my father's house is called the house of prayer for all nations. I see a crisis. It's job security for an intercessor. Do you understand? An imperfect world is job security for me. As long as I'm in an imperfect world, I've got something that will help me to become more like Jesus. We can be 100 years old and have this call of intercession and have this plant in our hearts at the throne of God's grace to see the world turn to Christ. You say, well, Francis, I've, I've had so many tell me that just between now and the future, the only thing that's happening is the rapture and everything else is going to get worse and worse and worse. Well, you know, I pity you (laughs) if that's how you view the last days because uh, there's a whole lot of good going on, all right? A lot of people talk about the, the darkness and the increasing darkness. I prefer to talk about the light that's coming, that's causing the shadows to turn and, and hide. Do you understand what I mean? There's a dawn going on. He said, this gospel of the kingdom of heaven, everybody say heaven. heaven. The gospel of the kingdom of heaven will be proclaimed in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end shall come. The good news before the bad news. I'm saying Isaiah 60, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Behold, nations, darkness covers nations, deep darkness, but the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. You say, well, I don't know if I believe that. I would. I would adjust your theology to believe that the glory of God is coming. It's just as easy to believe for the good as it is for just accepting the bad. In fact, easier. So, amen. Take two of those three times a day. That's the gospel. All right.
Are you with me, though? You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> now, what I'm going to suggest, I don't know. You know, we actually have on our In Christ Image training online school, we start this next April 4th or something like that. Do you guys know when it is? It's like the first week of April. But the registration is over March 27th, I think. Anyhow, I just want to invite you, if you've never taken it, it's an online course. We talk about Christ-likeness. We talk about prayer. talk about humility. We make it available for free. All right? So, uh, it's, you know, you can get in. Money's not an object. How many of you say that's been a big problem for you? Money's not been an object. <laughs> but I want to invite you personally. I'm believing God for something significant to occur in this part of uh, South Florida. I'm believing God. I, I, I've gone to a number of the, the churches here, and I'm believing we can see something significant built uh, if we get the church back to becoming the temple of Jesus Christ on earth and we become the house of prayer, man, nothing is impossible. And so I ask people also to join me in fasting 30 days, fasting 30 days from judging. Eat what you want. But don't judge for 30 days. You say, well, what will we think about? Because <laughs> that pretty much fills everything going on. Well, listen, remember this. This is called your temple. I wonder why. These are your temples. Inside is the temple of God. And we even act, actually have a body part called the temple. Let's make our heart. Let's build the mercy seat inside our heart because we are the temple of the living God. Know ye not that you are the temple of the living God. And inside that temple in Israel, there was a, in the Holy of Holies, it wasn't a seat of judgment. It wasn't a seat of wrath. It wasn't a seat that had all the things that were wrong. It was a seat of mercy. It was called the mercy seat. It was called the mercy seat. And the two cherubim and the seraphim sat next to, stood on either side of that seat, and they looking at the mercy. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. This is about him being fulfilled and our taking the steps into Christ's likeness that can pray, see a need, not be intimidated by it, to be unoffendable by the things that are wrong, and to see the kingdom, the salvation, the power, and the authority of Christ. Are you with me? If you're with me, would you stand? This time, this Sunday, is an important time, Lord, that we would be your temple, that we would be that house of prayer, that we would know the joy of praying redemption and forgiveness, that we would be a, a part of the river of life that brings healing to the nations healing to the church, healing to relationships, healing to our children and to our parents, healing to our neighborhoods. Lord, today we cast down the accuser of the brethren. We cast down the, the autopilot of criticism in our lives. We cast it down. Lord, we ask that we would hear the heartbeat of Jesus, that we would know how central this is that because that you you ever live to make intercession you ever live you are standing before the throne of God in intercession 
And Lord, you said, as he is, so also are we. Lord, we ask you, forgive us for simply finding fault with the things around us. Help us to capture our thoughts and to truly become a house of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Something that Francis has shared during his message is standing in the gap is the difference between the way things are and the way things could be. Just take a moment to imagine the way th things, not that they, they are, but the way that they could be. I believe it's important to envision those things, to let them be imprinted upon our spirits. pray over you that you would accept nothing less. Father, I thank you, Lord, for a Holy Ghost boldness, Lord, to stand in the gap for the way that things will and shall be, and even are now. We call those things that be not as though they are, and we'll speak into the heavens until they respond. They respond. We see the manifestation of those things here on this earth. We bless you, Lord, and I thank you for my brothers and my sisters, but they'll accept no less in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you were blessed? I want to ask that our ushers would come forward. I'm glad that Francis didn't quit 20, 25, whenever, however, however many years ago. Wow. No, I don't think it was that much. <laughs> but I, it, even now, I believe today's faithfulness and his ministry is going to mean tomorrow's mountain moving momentum. So, and I believe that also for us. Our faithfulness today is going to mean tomorrow's momentum as it's built. I believe it's important for us to honor the people, the prophets that God sends here. I want to ask that you would ask the Lord what your part is in blessing this man of God and his ministry. He didn't ask for anything. Uh, he, did, he just came because he wanted to share the word. But I also believe that it's in our heart to bless him for what he shared with us and to see the work of God continue. So come as your hearts are ready. Bless the Lord. So into this ministry and be a part of what God is going to do. Francis to be used by the Holy Spirit to bring a greater level of inspiration so that we would stand in the gap and see the way that things could be come to pass here and now. We pray, Father, that you would solidify that vision in our hearts as we believe for not just ourselves, but our families, our neighborhoods, our regions, our churches our friends and brothers visions and dreams we give you honor we give you praise in Jesus name amen before we close and we dismiss I just want to 
make sure that you're all aware that we are praying for the region on Mondays. We have a special time of prayer from 6.30 to 8.30. You don't have to be here for the whole two hours, but we do invite you to come and pray and be the house of prayer that will pray and be used to see the way that things will be. Amen? Be very blessed. Jesus loves you so much.